we have here a very, very versatile uh, uh, group of uh, panelists, all very senior, very accomplished in their fields and in their countries. We have an Israeli, well, I'm Israeli guy living in Israel. We have an Israeli guy living in New York. We have a Korean guy living in South Korea. We have a Danish guy living in Thailand and an Indian guy living in Singapore. <laughs> Did I make any diplomatic incidents or I got it right? <laughs> got it right. Okay, excellent. So now we can start with the uh, first round. Maybe you should introduce yourself in your own words uh, to the audience very briefly. We'll start with uh, this guy over here we never met before. That's true. Hello, I'm uh, Shaul Olmert. I'm a native of Israel and uh, I live in New York and uh, I run uh, PlayBuzz, which is a content platform that enables content publishers to create game-like experiences around their content and uh, easily distribute it to their audiences. Okay. I'm Thomas Song Kim from uh, South Korea. Actually, uh, I'm not a game guy, so I'm... <laughs> not a game guy. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm the advertising guy. So I work for advertising agency for uh, 12, uh, 20 years. But I uh, shift, shifted my uh, career to a visitor from 2008. So I uh, now uh, develop a communication platform, especially uh, combined with this uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think we'll be very curious to hear more about the angle of advertising and engaging the audience wi with games. I think it's a, one of the very big uh, segments. Thomas. Yeah. Um, so I'm Thomas, one of the co-founders of uh, PlayLab. We started about three years ago. Um, basically have grown extremely uh, fast in the last year. Over 100 guys now. Started in Bangkok. Um, last year we acquired Anino Games in the Philippines. Um, so yeah, uh, now we're expanding further into Southeast Asia with uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam on the map uh, for the next 18 months and are looking for more content and looking for good indie developers that we can help uh, bring their games to global markets. So that's kind of our focus. Excellent, and Vinit, uh, can you tell us a little bit what, uh, for those who don't know what Google is? <laughs> <laughs> so Google is a search engine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think that will ever pick up. That <laughs> has no future. I think it's a, it's a dead market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I manage gaming partnerships for Google in India, Southeast Asia, and Australia, New Zealand. I've been with Google for about a year and a half. And before that, I used to work with the Bay Area-based game developers for four years. And as Odin mentioned, I'm from India. And I'm not originally from gaming background. I worked with a bank for four years before I realized that it was not for me. So I quit my banking job and started working for a gaming startup and then moved to uh, Bay Area. And uh, can you tell us uh, just in a few words what is uh, Google doing around games these days? Sure, so I manage gaming partnerships and by gaming partnerships, uh, if you are a game developer, whether you are building games on console or desktop or mobile, if you are building your games, you can use our cloud products for building, for storage, for infrastructure. You can use our user acquisition products if you have a game and you want to expand your user base. You can use our platform products like Google Play, Android, Chrome Web Store to distribute your games, to engage your audience. You can use YouTube to like create a community. You can use AdMob, DoubleClick, our monetization products. If you have a game, you have users, you have a community, and if you want to make some money. So all these products are Google game-based products, and I work with game developers from uh, this region for gaming partnerships on all these products. Yeah, excellent. So uh, uh, Vinit will uh, be able to help uh, uh, whoever is interested in that to kind of find uh, their way inside uh, Google. Now, uh, by the way, just curious, how many game developers or gaming-related people are in the audience? Okay, so we see we have a very fresh uh, audience uh, to talk about this. And again, the topic is uh, engage your audience with games. So uh, maybe each of our panelists can tell us in a few words how they try to uh, engage their audiences uh, through games and what that means uh, for them. So uh, maybe we'll start this time. We'll surprise. Uh, we'll start from uh, the other side. Thomas, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think um, there, there's two, two, two ways you can either approach your audience um, and, and engage them in a good way. There's either be creating really good content for them, and I think both uh, we've been working with Vinate a lot um, on the analytics side, uh, uh -huh. and really from, from our games perspective, building a, a user experience that is really um, non-interruptive for the user, and, and that kind of in itself engages the user to continue using uh, playing the games and uh, kind of engaging them in, 
in, in the experience of, of, of playing the games. Um, the other way is by engaging with them outside of whatever it is you do, whether that's through community-driven stuff or, um, yeah, like events or anything else outside of the actual uh, app. And why, why do you think that's uh, necessary? I mean, why is everybody all of a sudden talking about the additional engagement? Aren't games engaging enough already? Once again, <laughs> I'm saying aren't game, uh, games engage, uh, in, engaging enough by definition that we need to add all these layers? Um, I, I think, uh, at least from, from a mobile games perspective, is a lot of indie developers don't look at their games as um, entertainment. They look at it as it's, it's a passion, it's a hobby, and their focus isn't really on the enter entertainment side. It's more on building their, their own passions. Um, where, where I come from, it's more focusing on the analytics and making sure that we actually have, have that flow that uh, makes it that engaging experience for the user and, and try to kind of plan out as much as we can of that experience for the user by, by using analytics and using um, different, different engagement tools with them, such as push notification or, uh, of, of course, the community management, which is a, I see as a side layer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, uh, th Thomas brings up a really valid point, which is uh, the platform became uh, an inherent part of the experience. Uh, in the old days when you designed games, they existed pretty much as a standalone entity. I mean, yes, you needed to adjust to the input device, whether it's a console controller or a keyboard and mouse. But other than that, the platform was fairly neutral. Today, you have to design not only to the input device or to the output device, meaning the size of the screen, you also have to design for the business model of the platform, such as you know, in-app purchases and the way that the economy of, uh, uh, first it was Facebook and now the mobile ecosystems work. Uh, you also have to design for the um, uh, you know, ways of distribution, for the integration of social media and how that plays into the experience. So you're no longer just creating um, a game experience. You are really creating uh, an experience that is very platform dependent and uh, very much um, adaptive to the way that people consume games because it used to be games is a very immersive experience. You know, when people play games, they forget about everything else, they're very focused. And in the old days, uh, people took the time to play a game and really detach themselves from reality. Uh, in today's world, when we talk about mobile, you know, we play games while we're talking to other people, while we're working, while we are, you know, driving, while we are sometimes, you know, whatever, in the shower or eating. Uh, so the whole experience that we are trying to design for... You're playing games in the showers and with your mobile phone? That's, you know... Uh, <laughs> uh, never mind, I don't want to know. Trust me, I, I saved you some information. You yes, know, thank you, I appreciate it. But just to say, uh, you know, when we design a game experience today, we don't just design uh, a game experience in a silo. We really adjust this experience to the uh, consumption patterns of, um, of uh, users and make something that you know, really has to tie in with their day-to-day. -day. And your company actually adds uh, what your company, which I don't know a lot about, but... Uh, is, Nobody does. Is, uh, yeah. uh, you're actually adding more engagement to kind of more static, dry sites. Maybe a quick sure. word about that. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't say dry, but uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, what we learned from, I've been a gamer all my life, and, um, you know, most people, uh, most people haven't. <laughs> and many people discover their affinity for games in the past few years when games became so accessible and so, um, you know, widely acknowledged. Um, maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started my career, there wouldn't be a game session in a tech conference because games would be perceived as some hobby for kids and definitely not as a big business, definitely not as something that's pushing the boundaries of technology, and definitely not as something that is uh, uh, geared towards adults. Uh, you know, those, those patterns have changed, and today we all like to play games in different capacities. And um, since the introduction of the uh, gamification concept, uh, I think it became uh, very clear to us at Playbuzz and to other people that it's great to mimic gameplay patterns and gameplay experiences and bring them to everyday life. So when we consume content, rather than consume it in a long form article, which is very attention consuming and uh, you know, really not adjusted to the, the way we consume content because at any point the phone can ring and interrupt our flow or you know, we're not really focused on reading but we're actually in the middle of a lot of other things. 
so you know, we're trying to create experiences to enable content creators to create uh, playful experiences uh, that take content and make it more playful, more accessible, easier to consume uh, given today's consumption habits. Excellent, and I'll give it as a, uh, just as a case study or an example, uh, Playbus has deployed on uh, MTV, AOL, Cosmopolitan 17, and New York Times, uh, build, focus a lot of uh, sites. I mean, I don't know a lot about the company, but. Um, so you're actually adding the gameplay element and the very simple interaction to regular content sites and publishing. Now, uh, Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of doing something similar in advertising, yeah, right? Yeah. Can uh, you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Yeah, in advertising industry, it's much tougher to persuade the consumer. So nowadays, we try to use this kind of gamification, mm -hmm. game elements, to uh, induce <coughs> the, the consumer people to engage our communication platform. Mm -hmm. So um, the main reason why we uh, try to find a solution for the strong engagement is, if I uh, just tell you something, you easily forget. Mm -hmm. If I show you, you can remember. But we make the people experience, you can totally understand. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And do you see any? Do you see better results when you add this kind of gamified experience or something like that? Or uh say it's not uh, the complicated one. It's very a simple one. For example, we um, the develop this mobile application for a Dunkin' Donuts client. Dunkin' Donuts. It's uh, we we call it morning starter. So <coughs> you uh, get up in the morning. You can choose the morning item, mm -hmm. and you have to to arrive at the Dunkin' Donuts shop within three hours. Uh -huh. It's very simple, yeah. but it's kind of the, the game element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can get a coupon. By the way, this is a great uh, concept. You know, you have the time, you need to make it, uh, so you have a little bit of the uh, attention and the sense of achievement once you got it on time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with similar concepts other way, or this is something unique to your uh, company? So I, I, uh, actually, uh, my company is, uh, I just started my, company so two two months ago so <laughs> actually I, I cannot I cannot tell much about uh, my company but uh, from my uh, past experience mm -hmm. so we now we, we can we can we can do everything for the very unique the marketing solution from the uh, develop mobile application sometimes we uh, the develop the um, the offline event and brand marketing, consulting, something like that. So more integrated one, mm -hmm. not just a single TV commercial. Yeah. So, mm. well, excellent, I think uh, it's a great concept and I just think uh, we'll see more and more of these kind of elements uh, that Joel adds to publishers, you add to uh, advertising. I think we'll see just more in that coming into any walk of life and, another, and a lot of different other uh, elements or services we consume. And uh, even let's say just in some uh, states in America, the utility bills, uh, they come with some sort of a comparative analysis of how you're doing compared to the neighbor. So this adds some kind of game dynamics into your electric bill, which is probably the most boring thing you can think of. And uh, we need, so how we say the, the company's called? Google? <laughs> Uh, yes. Kidding. So, uh, can you share a little bit about uh, your activities uh, and how you in try to engage uh, content more with games? Sure. So, from what we have experienced and what, like Charles and Thomas mentioned, that gaming has evolved significantly. So, it used to be a very simple cartridge that you would put in the console and you would play. Now there is like mobile games, like and now there are games on console which connect to online services. Now the desktop games, like from being a completely paid model to being like. Uh, and then like ad with advertising and then with premium. So what we believe is that along the process, we have also learned a lot about gaming. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to engaging the users, we believe in a few things that as a platform, it's our responsibility to provide developers that uh, the tools that they need to build like a business which is very successful. So whether it is tools like that help them build that community which is engaged. So like a lot of game developers have their content out on YouTube. So they use YouTube to build a community of users. Many of them, they use Google Play services. So like features like requests, challenges, leaderboards to engage their community. Then we have products that help developers understand 
what the users are actually doing on the game. So like play analytics, like Google analytics that Thomas mentioned, which help you understand how the users are engaging with your content, how they are like behaving like virally, are they actually consuming the content that you created for them? Are they doing some things which they like more, which you did not expect it to? Are they like consuming content which you thought like they would not? And like, so it helps them like build better content and optimize their content for the users. And the third part is the business model. Like uh, Shaul also mentioned that like business model has come a long way. So what we want to do is to provide developers tools. So whether they want to monetize like with advertising and no in-app purchases or whether they want to have just a paid model where the users actually purchase for the content they consume or whether they want to like provide users with free content and then monetize with subscriptions or like in-app purchases. An earthquake, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on. Sorry. So I was, I was just saying that uh, as a platform, we want to provide developers tools that help them build the best possible engagement model for their users. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, how do you see that affecting uh, kind of the Google activity? I mean, uh, Google Analytics, YouTube, uh, are, and all of these services have been there uh, for uh, a while. Are there any other big acquisitions uh, Google made, or it's just through these? Uh, properties, you try to add uh, more engagement, uh, we'd love, I'm sure the audience would love to hear a little bit more about that. So as I was saying, I think we have also come a long way when it comes to measuring engagement. Like gaming traditionally, like used to be a single young guy playing like on his console or stuck in the net cafe, there were no analytics. So there was no concept of measuring what happens when you ship the game. So if you ship the game and that has bugs, then it's not a good thing. But now gaming is continuously evolving. So if you have a build which is not very optimized, you can submit another build which is optimized. And likewise, Google Analytics, it used to be a web product, but now Google Analytics for mobile application has evolved significantly in the last one year. So now it measures like things like uh, cohort retention, it measures things like average revenue per user, lifetime value of users, you can create audience segments, you can actually target users who are say a male user like between like 20 to 30 year old playing from Philippines between 5 p.m. to like 10 p.m. or any other parameter that you want to. So we have also come a long way in terms of the tools that we provide. Uh, excellent, so uh, I'll go now and uh, I'll just refer, we guys got a very good question from the audience. Maybe we'll pop it up, maybe we won't. Which I think really relates to, oh, okay, we got it. So that really relates to just a few things we heard right now. So uh, the question is, how does a corporate start to engage customers through games and how do we measure success? So I think we kind of got uh, a lot of information now on how we measure the success. We have definitely the tools, everything is uh, measurable. So it can be either using the analytics systems that uh, Vinit mentioned or it can be just uh, counting the engagements or clicks like uh, Thomas and uh, Scholl are doing. But what about, uh, but it's very interesting to think well, how you think the play of corporates and brands, how will they find themselves with these gamification uh, trends? So uh, Shaul, you've been also in corporates and in startups and in <laughs> games, so maybe. And I'm still only 20 years old, isn't it amazing? Yeah. Uh, well, you're almost 50. You know, I think right? I'm fascinated with what uh, Thomas mentioned about uh, advertising because, you know, when you think about advertising, it's uh, we all hate advertising, right? I mean, we are trying to read an article and in the middle of it, there's some, some sort of a display ad that is really enforced upon us in, uh, you know, I don't think I ever clicked on a display ad in my life. And uh, I think that if people do, it's probably because they have fat fingers and they mistakenly click on them or something. It's a very poor experience. Sometimes I hear uh, publishers or advertisers or agencies show off with stats such as, we get more than 1% click-through rate. <laughs> yes, but what about the other 99% of your users that just had a really bad experience and uh, you, know, you just compromised uh, their whole interaction with your product and uh, and then you get you know the rates are really low and the whole maintenance and ad ops operation around the whole programmatic system are really a nightmare to manage uh, so it's kind of a lose-lose situation and once you turn it into a game uh, yes it requires much more work it's not as scalable as the automated ad network systems uh, it requires more innovation more creativity it's, uh, it's not as scalable, but it creates, you know, just like the Dunkin' Donuts uh, example that Thomas mentioned, it creates an unforgettable, unique experience, a real 
interaction with your brand, a real, um, you know, relation of your brand to a fun, meaningful experience. And I think that's that's the way people should go and brands should go. And I see some uh, uh, innovative publishers out there that are being very bold about neglecting uh, display ads and standard uh, IAB uh, ad units altogether and move only towards native ads, towards more playful experiences. And, uh, you know, obviously I think that's, that's uh, where the market should go. When an old industry like the TV industry sees how in the uh, age of uh, uh, VOD and uh, DVR, everybody's trying to skip ads, it's becoming kind of a cat and mouse chase. It's like the advertiser is trying to uh, force itself upon the consumer. The consumer is trying to run away from it. Sounds to me like something is broken in this ecosystem and solutions like the ones that uh, uh, Thomas is developing uh, sound like the, the direction in which the market should really go. Yeah, and Thomas, you mentioned uh, Dunkin' Donuts, so I don't know how much they're adaptive to technology and to these kind of concepts, but I'm sure some of the brands are very much old school and uh, they really need to be educated. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the challenge of taking very low tech and old school businesses mm -hmm. and getting them into the most uh, advanced ways to interact with your audience? We would love to hear uh, a little bit about that. Uh, actually, we use very low tech. It's not high tech. It's a very simple mobile application. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, real benefit from the, the kind of the commission platform is the um, free PR effect. Mm -hmm. not, not, uh, without <coughs> invest any single <coughs> money for publish. So I think uh, if it is uh, interesting or fun, enough to share through your own social media. Mm -hmm. That's the point, yeah. that's the solution. So, I mean, that, that's the real benefit. Uh, and uh, do you think uh, just the selling process to these brands, they understand it or you need to go to them from the very basic? I mean, I know Korea, uh, South Korea is very advanced in these yeah, elements, but uh, everybody understands it now or you mm -hmm. still need to go explain the benefits and... Uh, yeah, yeah, so they're retargeting that kind of situation. Korea, so the, especially young generations usually they use the mobile application for fun, so that's the, our strategy, targeting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think it's, uh, you can obviously do much better targeting with the tools uh, we have today. Now, uh, Thomas, uh, I wouldn't call you Tom, Thomas one or two because Thomas. you're both number ones, mm. but uh, <laughs> so the second uh, Thomas number one, or the first second Thomas number one. Yeah. Uh, so, so just to follow up on the whole yeah, there. Please. The advertising side of things is, is I have, uh, it's an ambivalent fault like um, relationship I have with it because yes, we can monetize on one side from our games perspective, but we're destroying the user experience for the users. Um, so it, it, it ultimately depends also if you're a brand advertiser on, on how you want your brand to be perceived, whether you wanna do it through interstitials. There are still a lot of people who click those ads, um, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. And of course, the more targeted it is, the better. Um, and, but one of the things that I'm seeing that's working really well for us and for brand advertisers is rewarded videos. Um, so whenever users, basically they're incentivized to watch these videos, um, that help, that it's, it's a low cost for brand advisor, ad, advertisers to get in on. And um, we get a lot of views out of it from the users without it really destroying the user experience. Um, so you're just another, so you're one of the ways, I mean, inside of a very entertaining and successful gaming company yeah. with, uh, if I'm not correct, ten mil tens of millions of uh, users, maybe maybe more now. It, so you're, so you're w one of your ways to monetize it is by becoming the brand's uh, tool yeah. for engagement. For yes, that so, so there's, I, I have to there's, disagree there's two things to that, like um, just <laughs> where we've had more than 25 million uh, downloads across all of our games. and. Um, the advertising is, uh, it can be a good source of revenue, uh, but you really got to segment your users and that's why you got to know them to make sure that you're not uh, disrupting the experience for your paying users. Um, so, so really segmenting your users and knowing which ones that you're not capable of monetizing in other ways um, and then showing them ads instead of the ones that you're monetizing because the, the chances of you, you, as you talked about, uh, with a 1% click-through rate, you're, you're annoying 90% of, 99% of your users, and, and that's not ideal when you want them to actually pay for content within your games. Um, so, so, so really, it's about segmenting and trying to find those percentages of users um, that are willing to click and download uh, if it's games that you're promoting within your uh, app, or so, so you can really monetize those users um, differently, because it is still a small percentage of users 
overall that end up doing in-app purchases. Um, and then one of the other differences is that in-app purchases is scalable uh, on a global scale. Um, so, so there's no limits to it, whereas from advertising, we're always trying to get higher fill rates um, when we're showing advertisements. Um, and there's, also, of course, also the, the revenue generated in India on Android compared to US on iOS. There's, there's dramatic differences in that. Um, but one of the trends that I've noticed over the last couple of years is that the costs um, we, in, on, in terms of CPI cost per install that we pay for marketing, they have continuously increased over time. And I think prior to right now, um, it's not been that profitable to do the, um, to show advertisements because you're disrupting, disrupting the experience more mm -hmm. than you're monetizing. Whereas I think because the prices have gotten to a level where they are now, it's actually starting to make sense as a revenue source for us as a company. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, just the last sentence is that the economy is still changing because of the constantly increasing uh, user acquisition costs. Yeah. And, and, and that's because of analytics. So, so in mobile games, you've, you've gotten a better understanding of your users. You okay. found better ways of monetizing them over the last several years. And because of that, users are worth more to you as a game developer, so you're willing to pay higher prices for those users. Um, and that in turn lifts up the marketing budgets of like globally because you have huge companies going in and doing media buyouts across different channels, and then that pushes up the, the cost of Thanks. Excellent, and I think Shaul wanted to disagree, yeah, and again, I, I, I ask you nicely, please disagree <laughs> as much as sure. you can, so yeah. it'll be interesting. I was going to say, this is beca becoming too much, you know, too nice, this panel, so I had to spice things up a little. You know, I would hope that you would take your proceeds from the uh, increased lifetime value of the user and invest it in creating a more immersed experience for the user, not a more sophisticated disruption for the user by, you know, by or, you know, paying uh, more for it. There's something... Um, you know, there's something broken in the ecosystem to start with if uh, a game is meant to create immersion. It means to divert you from the day-to-day, -day, take you away from whatever it is that you're doing, and have you focused on something which is imaginary. Have you adapt to the uh, new reality that the game is creating, this new world, uh, and kind of get sucked into it. And advertisers are the exact opposite. Advertisement is the exact opposite of it. So I think there's something very alienating to start with, while what Thomas is describing is actually a really win-win. But you know, if I'm um, after a game experience, or after reading an article, and I get a challenge that uh, uh, whatever brand is asking me to do something and give me a chance to uh, win something, uh, whether it's tangible or just get the feeling of uh, triumph and winning, uh, then that's a great experience. You know, it's great for the brand, it's great for the user, it's great for everyone involved. Yeah. Um, and you know, I also want to ask Thomas because you know I'm really curious. In uh, in the editorial world, when we talk about content, uh, which is you know more the world that uh, that, uh, that myself and Playbuzz are focused on, uh, we are constantly ch uh, trying to think about whether the role of the human editor uh, has been outsourced to technology, uh, and to what degree can algorithms and big data uh, take over the uh, human decision making. Uh, of a content editor. And I'm curious, you know, how does that play in game design mm -hmm. when you're really trying to optimize the experience less based on the gut feeling of what makes immersion and more based on hardcore stats of usage that are very measurable? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good uh, question. So some of the things uh, that we have been doing on that side is, is, is basically try, trying to shift away more from a subjective personal decision from a game design standpoint uh, and move it more towards looking at data um, for the game design aspect. As you mentioned, um, one of the latest things that we've developed is uh, basically an AI for our games or match three social games. Um, and, and for each level, we basically have an AI that replays these levels with a different mindset of our users. Um, thousands of times, and then that gives us some data on uh, basically how should we balance this game, uh, how many moves should they get, what are the scores, what should the objectives be, and, and all of this information we actually use then to, uh, of course, in the end there's human interaction and in making the decision on what the final metric should be, but um, we, we use that information to make better decisions. Um, so, so that's kind of how we, in, whereas pre before that we actually would launch our um, levels and games out into the market, push tens of thousands of users through, get some information back, and then it would be a much longer cycle, whereas now we can actually um, automate a big part of that process. Yeah, so um, 
if you need your, uh, just to complete the roundabout, the original questions about uh, the brand, we'd love to hear a few thoughts of. Uh, so I would also like to disagree. I think there should be one more dissenting voice. Uh, when it comes to advertising, uh, I think there is truth that advertising formats have not evolved like they should have on mobile and digitally. Like if you compare it with Super Bowl, like advertisers pay like four and a half, five million dollars for a 30 second slot, which is watched by 100 million like users, which is like, like I mean 30, like 35 dollars eCPM. On mobile uh, and on Super Bowl, you never know how many people actually watch that ad, whether they did. And Super Bowl, probably you can, but most of the TV advertising, it's very difficult to find out. On mobile, you can target the users. You can find out when they are watching, how long they have watched an ad, whether they are clicking on it or not. And yet this like eCPMs on mobile ads, like for videos are like $5, $7, $10. So there is a disconnect. That being said, I think advertising as a business model, the way we would like to think about it is all about giving users choice. Gaming, if you think about it, it's probably the only business where you have same experience for all of the users and yet 98% of the users do not pay anything. Yeah, and so uh, I actually- mean, uh, if, you, if you were running uh, like a restaurant or like this conference or any business, like no business can sustain if only 2% of the users end up paying. So advertising is another way to monetize those users who would have otherwise not paid. So I think instead of thinking of it more as a disruption, it's about like thinking of giving users options that, hey, if you want to pay for the content, feel free to pay for it and you'll not see any advertising. If you don't want to like pay for content, the developer still needs to develop that content and they still need to improve upon it because you like it. So if you don't want to pay, then watch these ads. At the same time, I think it's important to also do it in a way which is not like completely like, I mean, like spoiling the user experience. So I think it's probably evolving. It's not really there where it should have been. But at the same time, when we think of users and user experience, like think of ourselves, right? We go to movies, we see ads. We like, I mean, go to like music concerts, we go to like like stadiums, we see ads everywhere. So why is it that when we are playing- But we hate it, don't we? I mean, it's like we, people prefer not watching live TV programming because it has all those commercials and you know, they wanna uh, DVR it and then skip those ads. So I'm just saying the users are telling us something. They're telling us that they're too, you know, they're exhausted of uh, watching ads. Uh, and that you know they're looking for an experience that is ads free. Why not go with the users and find a way that will require more thinking and more creativity? It's not as scalable. So, so you know, for I, someone I, like Google, it can't move the needle on their you know fifty billion dollars a quarter uh, income to sixty billion dollar. But you know, it creates more. It creates a better experience for you know for the publisher and uh, for its audience. Indeed, so I'm yeah. not disagreeing with that. Uh, what I'm saying is that the formats have yet to evolve. So mobile gaming, if you think of it, like it's hardly like three, four, five years old. TV advertising has been around for so long. And now people like watch Super Bowl because they want to see the ad. So I'm saying that like in the next few years, probably a lot of things will change. Probably the ad formats will evolve. The payouts will be better. The targeting will be much better. So instead of thinking of advertising as just a way to annoy users, like probably it's better way to think of it as another business model to make money from the users who otherwise would not pay. And also to like address the point that only 1% click like on the ads. The way I would like to think of it is that if 100 users or like number of users are engaging with your content, the 1% like is a small amount. Every time they click on that, you make money. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather that like a lot of your users click on that and you make a lot of money. And it's like not really that much of outflow. And those users would have dropped off anyway. If yeah. they're clicking on an ad, probably they don't really have anything interesting to do on the game and they wanted to exit. So you'd rather that they click on the ad and then exit. Yeah, so uh, I think actually the two things you said uh, can just uh, co uh, coexist. And uh, in that manner, one of the question uh, uh, we got again from the audience, uh, which really relate again to the brand and the whole thing. The other side of the cone uh, is uh, what are your thoughts of potentially ethically dubious risk of consumer manipulation through games uh, and how can a corporation manage this risk? I think again, maybe Thomas can, uh, as the one who's more in the advertising and working with brands, uh, what do you think about the risk you take there if you're manipulating into something? Uh <laughs> it's a very tough question. Anyway, the, uh, there's always the issue of mani manipulation raises mm -hmm. these days, but the, um, the new channel, I mean new media, especially using the, the game companies, 
is is pretty rare in the all, all of the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I, th I think the, um, we, 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 uh, we, we don't have to pick something negative on this, uh, the, uh, the new media ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we try to find a more positive one to entertaining, to entertain people. And we can, we can, some, we can, I, I think we can find some values from this kind of new communication. Mm -hmm. So you're just saying we're not just putting it into the yeah. users, we're communicating. It's yeah. not that we're brought, it's, it's an interesting. Uh, Everything has pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting approach that we're not just streaming the advertising, but we're in a conversation and therefore we see the feedback when it's uh, manipulated uh, or not. Any of the other uh, panelists want to comment on that? We can, can proceed uh, to the following uh, question. And one of the questions we got here, which is again more focused on uh, games, and it's a very hard question uh, to answer, is uh, what, uh, oh, oh, for, that's a great user experience. It's too sophisticated to me, but I think I got it, yeah. What is the most effective way to get download uh, for your games? So I can just say, yeah, you obviously should uh, answer this one. I, I, I could say that the only one that I know with doing it without uh, uh, download budget is either ca coming up with something uh, very viral or you need to pray a lot. But uh, maybe a more professional. Yeah, uh, so yeah. the, the Flabby Bird approach is one way um, <laughs> where, where you're really trying to push something in the market and then Apple handpicks you out of another million developers and, and you get that uh, <laughs> success story out there and Apple is happy, and I'm using Apple in this case. And they're, they're, they promote all the indie developers to continue developing more games. Um, I think uh, from, from my perspective, the best way to get downloads for your game is always to create something, uh, some kind of content in your game or a game that it's actually enjoyable and fun to play. Um, I, I see the marketing side as, as, uh, as, an, as, as a way to get your product to the market and getting downloads that way. Um, you can always do marketing and you can do that for whatever content. It's just the better your content is, the more marketing you can do and the more marketing dollars you can spend on, on advertising. Um, I think the best to shorten it all down, to get the best, uh, to get the most downloads uh, for your games is to make good content. Um, people will share it, people will tell it to their friends uh, if you make great content. You can help them uh, along that process by adding viral features, um, integrating with uh, Google's uh, achievements, uh, leaderboards, uh, the yeah, and Play actually Center, Game Center, uh, Facebook for that matter, share things on WhatsApp. There's a million different things you can do to give them, to enable it to make easier for the users to share that with their friends. Yeah, you, you obviously need to find each user and give them uh, the tools he's already, or she is already used to, uh, to share. I mean, you won't say someone you want to recommend this, you need to go and download uh, whatever uh, WhatsApp or something new that they uh, don't have. And uh, what do you think, again, like um, Vinit said uh, earlier about uh, things like uh, trying to build an audience through places like YouTube and so on, just create a big uh, funnel and out of uh, which to convert more users. That's probably uh, another way, but I think uh, good content is, uh, is, um, always, uh, is always the best uh, way to do it. And uh, Shaul, as uh, somebody who's uh, his company where it's been the most shared property on, uh, on Facebook for several uh, months already, uh, what do you think about how the share in the social can convert into downloading or can you use one sure. thing with a lot of shares to get people to download something else? I think that people spend way too much time and energy on the tactics, on figuring out hacks, on trying to reverse engineer the ecosystem, figure out how you get more exposure on Facebook, how do you get better SEO on Google. At the end of the day, all of these ecosystems, whether it's the uh, you know, infamous uh, uh, Facebook newsfeed algorithms, or Google's uh, search engine uh, brain, uh, they're trying to create an optimal experience for users. They're trying to make sure that users find what they're really looking for, whether they are ve being very articulate in how they express their search query, or whether they just you know, browse around. Uh, the platform is trying to match them with the content that they are most likely to enjoy and engage with. So at the end of the day, as simplistic and naive as it may sound, as Thomas says, it's really all about creating good content. When you know, some uh, 
a girl from England bought a dress and wasn't sure exactly which color it is and uploaded a picture of it. It got to about a billion users within 24 hours because apparently it was an interesting story. And people you know, thought it was interesting and, and needed to share it. And they used every available media uh, to do that. So you know, again, it sometimes happens that uh, I don't know, somebody opens a really great restaurant with great food and nobody hears about it and then gets shut down. But if you look at the overall quality wins, and you know, I think that people should, uh, especially publishers and game developers, uh, should direct their, their attention into creating quality products. And yes, it doesn't mean that every, you do have to be smart about how you manage it. You, have, you do have to be technical. You do have to work hard and, and you know, use a lot of analytics and do a lot of optimization. But at the end of the day, none of it is really rocket science. It's just very day-to-day um, -day hard work. The rocket science, or the part that's really hard to crack and really hard to teach uh, and really hard to um, uh, you know, manipulate is how do you create a meaningful piece of content? How do you create something that has um, true inspiration for users? And I think that the more we um, impose those very uh, technical form of thinking and very analytically driven thinking on the creative process, the more we push the market toward mediocre knockoffs, me too's, not very interesting products. I think the real innovation in gaming came from, um, you know, Minecraft, came from uh, Skylanders, came from products that dare to think outside of the box and do things that are different. And guess what? The business models and everything else kind of find their way, you know, people liked it so much, they find a way to pay for it, even if it was against everything that a McKinsey consultant will tell you in their research report about how people pay for products. The product was good, users bought it, period. Yeah, and actually, this is a good question for Thomas um, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you agree with Show that assuming that the experience itself will be good and so on, you as an advertiser or as somebody who's providing the tool for advertising is more probably, if you see something that people like and it doesn't really fit the business model, will you try to go and build something new around it just to monetize it or do you think you'll just uh, use your regular uh, means? So actually, um, for more, if we uh, get a more effective visual from, from the market, so we <coughs> try to persuade the, the client, advertiser, mm -hmm. with um, uncommon way. So uh, sometimes we uh, the pro uh, propose our idea proactively, not waiting for the client sign. Mm -hmm. So uh, this kind of very unique solution, so we uh, it can can have uh, the great performance from the market. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the situation, but I think the um, if it is uh, very unique to uh, can be approached to the the consumers effectively, we can we can we have to pick. The kind of solution, not just from the uh, the, the request from the client. Mm -hmm. the, sometimes the proactive proposal is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think again, it works uh, very yeah. clear, uh, consistent with your previous answer about the having the constant conversation and mm -hmm. uh, hearing back. So this is another way for the to do this. Now well, we don't have a lot of uh, more time. Just one last question, which I think uh, uh, is a very good question. I'll try to even to answer it myself. That one. Yeah. Uh, what do you think are the elements that make an addictive and successful casual mobile game like uh, Flappy Bird or Clash of Clan? I think I can translate the question to what, uh, what's the secret of making uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller, which was a best-selling album, rather than uh, Tom Waits, which is a lot of uh, quality and nobody uh, buys it except for a few uh, addicts. Do you think there is there is, uh, and I think it's a good uh, question to, uh, as the last question of the panel, do you think there is uh, some sort of uh, way, paradigm, process to come up with uh, hits or something super popular? Or you think just like any other form of or art, it's some sort of a human magic that will get people to use it? And you've done some I magic in the past, so. Um, I, I think there's two radical differences between Flappy Bird and Clash of Clans. Um, yeah. The way I see it, yeah, it also okay. depends on how you define success. Is success in terms of revenue, or is success in terms of? I, 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 I guess. I mean, I didn't write the question, but I assume it's in terms of deployment. 
Um, yeah, because for example, Flappy Bird was a really successful viral title made out of uh, Vietnam, and, and it got millions of downloads um, monetization-wise. I think it has made probably around like 0.5% or maybe even less than that of uh, what Clash of Clans has. Here, yeah. um, so so I, would, I would personally define Clash of Clans as a great success, and, and, and that, has, that is a title that has been very based tremendously on analytics and yeah. balancing within the game. So you, th you think this is more a performance marketing play than a creative play in Clash of Clans, or you think you have to have a bit of both? Um. Aha, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't think I mean, you we'll, can we'll predict, you cannot be, I don't think I mean, er, there are a lot of the performance the marketing like experts that performance didn't. Performance marketing with, in, in terms of Flappy Birds, I think that's a, that's an outlier. Um, no, I meant for a clash of clans, that it's, uh, I mean, there are a lot of very good performance marketing experts that don't get this yeah. kind of deployment, so there has to be some of the secret sauce, I, at least that I want to believe that uh, people have. But that's, that's why I think from Clash of Clans, you've made such a good exp experience throughout the game. You're engaging the users really well, you're keeping them over time, you're monetizing them really well, and, and that gives you a competitive advantage over other games that are doing similar stuff um, with it. So it, there is a performing marketing element in that uh, because you can spend obviously more on advertising um, for a game like Clash of Clans with higher profit margins compared to others uh, that might not be able to spend the same amount. Yeah, excellent, so uh, we ran out of uh, time, but before we uh, finish this uh, completely, today is a very special day for one of our panelists. Uh, Shaul proved that any idiot can be 40. That's his 40th yeah. birthday. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Ah. I just thought we'd make up it was someone's birthday for the... <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason they invited me. They looked for someone who was born on April 28th and... Uh, we planned the whole conference around you. We were thinking of the date. <laughs> That's the way to... <laughs> well, thank you. I think you got the um, uh, number, you got the digits in That's reverse order. It's That's actually... Right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, now blow the candles because we have something else for you. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. Hey, thank you. And now, don't I get to eat the cake? No, you get, oh, but, no, uh, the, but while they're cutting it for you, you will get to eat the cake for sure. While they're cutting it for you, so as you know, Play Buzz of Shaul was uh, doing very well recently. And, uh, and uh, I'm looking at the screen, yeah? There yeah, okay, so here the Play Buzz crew oh, wow. and Anthony and Daniel, we arranged some <laughs> sort of a quiz for you. Come, come to the podium, it'll be easier wow. to see you hey. playing the game. Four <laughs> things you never knew about Shaul Ormer. And this is, by the way, how Play Buzz works. You write a few things, you add the interactive layer, so you'll be able to see what's Play Buzz. Play Buzz. Men of mystery, that's great. <laughs> okay, so let's pretend oh. we're the clicker, we clicked. Okay, so I'll read it because okay. um, Shaul likes to work on puzzles during meetings. He doesn't know it, but we like to shuffle the pieces from time to time to see if he notices. That's the play buzz stuff. Okay. Next. Next. <laughs> ah, true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why aren't you cutting the cake for him? The question okay. and the answer. Uh, uh, sure, yeah, after the panel, if anybody wants to, uh, you know, relieve any Simpson episode, just let me know. <laughs> Next. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> ah, thank you, but enough about me. No, but you want to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's one, um, do you want to see? Sure, it? a surprise, why not? Yeah, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. Oh wow.
Saul. I want to wish you a happy birthday and uh, may all your wishes come true. Um, we done with this shit? Let's get back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. That's the ultimate. Isn't it amazing how such an ugly guy can have such beautiful uh, kids? So do you have a oh, spoon? Thank you. Oh, thank you. you like uh, pull it? Uh, like. <laughs> hey! Thank you. Not Any more surprises one. for me? That's <laughs> birthday beats. <laughs> it's even better that way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow.